Good morning. My name is Sarisha Ganta. Welcome to this morning's installment of the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta's monthly webcast series. Today we have Leah Singleton here from Thompson Hine, who will be speaking to us about retirement plan alternatives for nonprofits. And we're very excited to have Leah here for part two of her employee benefits program. She spoke earlier um, during a few months ago about employee benefits, so um, she'll be speaking to us more today about retirement plans. Uh, before she starts on her topic, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta and its mission. Our mission is to maximize the engagement of transactional attorneys in the Atlanta area by connecting them with local nonprofits in need of free business legal services. Our clients are 501c3 organizations, either headquartered or serving primarily Metro Atlanta, and who serve low income or disadvantaged individuals and are otherwise unable to afford business legal services. If you're interested in becoming a client or finding out more information about our organization, please visit our website. Um, our website also has a lot of great resources, including articles, past webcasts, and a list of future events that we'll be holding. So please check that out. Um, and one more thing, uh, please keep in mind that today's information that Leah will be sharing with you is just general information. If you have specific legal questions about your organization, please reach out to an attorney. And now, Leah, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's so good to be here. So um, my name is Leah Singleton. I've been an employee benefits attorney since around 2002 when I graduated law school and I practice at Thompson High. So this presentation is a collection of discussions to assist you in selecting a retirement plan that meets your needs for your organization. Um, there's a lot of different retirement plans that nonprofits can choose. You actually have more choices than a for-profit entity. Um, and so this is just a general overall summary of some of the differences and some of the characteristics of each plan. My husband was asking me this morning, what are you going to go talk about? And I was like, well, I'm talking about all the retirement alternatives for nonprofits. He goes, really? I was like, yeah, there's lots of different plans that a nonprofit can choose. Um, he's like, well, which one's best? And I was like, well, it doesn't really work that way. Um, there's, the, there's different ones and different plans are best for different entities, depending on what your goals are, what your budget is, who you're trying to benefit. And so the purpose of this, um, this presentation is just to, to kind of do some comparing and contrasting for those of you considering um, offering a retirement plan to your employees or officers, or maybe you already have a retirement plan and it's not working quite for you or for your organization, you want to make some changes. Um, these are things to, um, to look at. So retirement plans vary widely in their design and administration. They're actually governed by two main pieces of law. One is the Internal Revenue Code, which allows you to save for retirement on a tax deferred basis. So you can put money in or an employer can, can put money in. The employee doesn't have to pay taxes on that until they're retired. Um, because the taxes are deferred, the IRS has a lot of rules on what you can do and what you can't do. Um, on top of that is the is ERISA, which is a law passed in the 70s, um, and it's through the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor is concerned with anything that involves employees. So obviously they're going to be concerned with their retirement plans. Um, the ERISA laws protect the retirement for retirees so that companies can't use retirement money set aside for someone's retirement to go pay the light bill. That's what ERISA does. ERISA has nothing to do with the tax consequences of, of these plans. So. Um, the, complying with the Internal Revenue Code and the Department of Labor rules um, is important when you when you put forth these plans. So before starting a retirement plan, um, you should consider what type of plan, how you want to establish it, how to operate and maintain it, and how to terminate the plan if, if you 
um, how long you want the plan to last. Some plans cannot be terminated quickly. Um, and so if you're just trying to put something in place for one employee who's going to retire in two years, that'll greatly limit your options for some of the type of plans because it's not a plan that you want in place for a decade or longer or for everyone. So before making a decision on the types of plans that um, you want to offer, you need to look at your priorities and what you're actually trying to accomplish. The first thing I want to talk about was the small employer retirement programs. These are actually plans and programs that the company doesn't sponsor themselves, so to speak. Um, the company just contributes on behalf of an employee. Um, th these are because small businesses and small entities seldom have the resources of a larger corporation. And um, But you may still want to offer benefits to your, your employees for retirement. So I thought we'd go over these quickly. The first one is the payroll deduction IRA. So you can see this is an, an individual retirement account that a person has and the employer, the, the, the entity, all they do is take money out of their paycheck and put it in the IRA. So the employee can decide, hey, I want to put $200 a month into my IRA and the employer takes it out of their paycheck on a pre-tax basis and puts it in the IRA for them. Um, the employer itself is not really sponsoring that IRA. All they are is a, is a funding vehicle to um, save the employee trouble and they can, it, it can actually be used as a perk to say, hey, you know, we, we help you by, we'll do direct deposit to, to your IRA and um, if you're not offering anything, this might be a good option to, to offer. Um, so a simple payroll IRA deduction is the simplest type of thing you can do. Um, the employer can set up the IRA or the employee sets up the IRA and the employer's involvement is limited to just taking money from payroll and dumping it into the IRA. There's nothing to be filed for the employer. There's no real administration for the employer. The employee's contributions are limited to the um, to the maximum that anybody can contribute to an IRA. Um, so it's $6,000 for 2019. That's how much an employee can contribute to an IRA. And uh, if you don't know, that amount phases out the higher amount of money someone earns. So someone earning too much money, they cannot contribute anything to an IRA. Um, so no employer contributions are permitted for this type of vehicle. Um, only the employee's money they would have made through a payroll basis. But if you're not offering anything, this is a great option. It's low cost um, and um, it doesn't require a lot of effort to actually provide that convenience. The next one is called the SEP. And a SEP stands for a Simplified Employee Pension. It's very similar to an IRA, except the employer can also contribute money to it. Um, if an employer sets up a SEP, they have to contribute the same percentage to all your employees. So um, the maximum you can contribute is 25% of their compensation. Um, but if you're contributing 5% of the officer's compensation, you have to contribute 5% of the secretary's compensation. So the percentage has to be the same. The dollar amount obviously is not going to be the same, but the percentage has to be the same. The employer can make those contributions to it. Um, and um, the employee does not make contributions to the SEP. They would need like an IRA or something else to put to put their money in. So the next one is called the simple IRA. So the simple IRA um, it stands for a savings incentive match plan for employees and it's in an IRA account. And this one allows both employer contributions, much like the SEP, 
and employee contributions, much like a, a regular IRA. It's kind of the two combined. Um, you're only allowed to offer this if you have 100 or less employees. So if you're a big organization, this is off the table for you. Um, you set up an IRA for each individual employee. It actually has to be a simple IRA, but any bank who sets up IRAs can help you with that designation. Um, employees can make their own contributions or their deferrals. In 2019, it's limited to 13000 So that's how much an employee can put into that from their paychecks. And when we say an employee puts the money in, what usually happens is the employee makes an election. I want to put in 10% of my paycheck. The employer doesn't pay that 10% to the employee, doesn't take out the taxes on it, and the employer sends that money directly to the IRA during each payroll period. So um, the employer is not holding on to the funds. As soon as the employees paid, whatever amount goes to their direct deposit or check to the employee, and the amount the employee asked to put into the simple IRA goes directly to the bank that holds the IRA. So um, kind of a split deposit there. Um, to have a simple IRA, the employer must either put 3% um, of an employee's compensation into it if the employee contributes. So if the employee does not contribute, um, then the employer does not have to put anything in. So if the employee contributes 5% of their compensation, the employer would only match 3%. If the employee contributes 50% of their compensation, the employer would only match 3%. If the employee contributes 2% of their compensation, the employer would only match 2% because it's up to a 3% match. So you can do a match that way, or you can put a flat 2% of everybody's compensation into the simple IRA as employer contributions and not have to worry about keeping up with matching and, and all of that. But you do have to put that in everyone's account regardless of whether they contribute or not. So, so simple IRAs are fairly popular. Um, to set any of these up, you would just contact a financial institution, um, a bank, any of um, the big houses like a Fidelity or Vanguard are very good at setting these up, but they're kind of suited for larger employers, and you may have better luck with a, with your local bank and um, someone that you regularly do your finances with. And they can help you set any of these up. You do have to execute some documents, depending on which one of these you're doing, um, and keep some records. As you can see, we started with just payroll deductions to an IRA. There's very limited involvement for an employer for that. With the simple IRA, you do actually have to keep records to prove that you either put 2% of everyone's compensation into an account, or you match 3%. So you can see how there's some more detailed record keeping in this type of plan than in another type of plan. And it's up to you to keep the records. Um, a simple 401k is the, the next kind of step. And um, it's very much like the simple IRA, except they have a 401k account instead of an IRA account. Um, there's really not that much difference between the two, except um, the platforms that of investments that are available for an IRA tend to be different than the platform of investments that are available for 401ks. And so for different investments, you might want to have a simple 401k instead of a simple IRA. But they're really pretty much the same. Um, you have to have less than 100 employees. Um, the employee can only contribute 13000 for 2019, and the match and the um, fixed percentage is the same. So there's the, the simple IRA and the simple 401k are really the same types of plan constraints or program constraints. It's just the account that it's sitting in is different, whether it's an IRA account and whether, whether it's a 401k account. And, and honestly, the two differences between those tend to be the bank holding the account and with what kind of investment options are available to a 401k account versus an IRA account. So that's, that's the difference between those two. Um, I wanted to go over these four type of um, 
of kind of programs for you just because if you don't have a retirement plan for your employees these four are the simplest to um, set up and I started from the simplest and went to the most complicated and um, they're a great benefit to to offer as you can see the simple IRA and the simple 401k require the entity to put the money in the account so if you have a simple IRA and you have a bad year in donations or whatever and, or something came up and you had to pay extra funds somewhere and you don't have the money to put in these simple IRAs and simple 401ks you've got a problem that's not to say that problem can't be fixed with the going down the right path but it does need to be addressed because when you have a simple IRA or a simple 401k plan or even a SEP in place a SEP allows you to um, decide how much money to put in each year so you have some discretion there but the simples do not and so if you get through the year and you see hey I can't put this money in like I was before you probably need to call an attorney like me or the financial institution that's helping you with these and and tackle that problem on a proactive basis and not just stop the contributions once you have one of these programs in place so um, the simples are a commitment and they need to to and it's a long-term commitment but they're a great retirement um, benefit for employees a way to attract employees and a way to keep them um, after they're there Alia, question about sure. the payroll deduction IRA yeah. and the set are those um, available for any size organization or is there a cap they're, they're actually available um, the the especially the payroll deduction IRA is available for any size organization the SEP I don't remember off the top of my head but I think it is available for any type of organization um, that they, they they're not ERISA plans there's no um, filings and, and things like that for them um, but a but a any size nonprofit could definitely put in place a payroll deduction IRA okay the next kind of group of things we're talking about are actually plans so the ones we talked about before are kind of considered programs <laughs> and not really plans and I guess there's a legal difference there um, but the retirement plans that we're going to talk about are what you are traditionally think of like a retirement plan like a 401k account or, or a 401k plan or something like that that they're um, more complicated than the other four avenues that we just talked about um, and they require more thought more maintenance um, and and more administration so um, before we kind of get into that wanted to um, say retirement plans are governed both by the Internal Revenue Code and ERISA these retirement programs that I just finished talking about are not governed by ERISA they're just plain tax vehicles um, Department of Labor doesn't see those as retirement plans that they get their hands in and um, want to oversee and like I said the Department of Labor's motive in having their laws is to protect an employee's retirement plans once you're promised retirement you get to keep that retirement this um, ERISA came out in 1974 as a response to Studebaker's bankruptcy and I'm telling you this so you can kind of help to understand when a tax um, law is applicable to a retirement plan and when an ERISA is applicable to a retirement plan but ERISA was a response to Studebaker going bankrupt um, in the 60s and they had employees that had worked on the assembly line for 20 years that were promised retirement and there were no laws to protect that there were tax laws and tax benefits that the company could take but there was nothing to actually protect that so what Studebaker did is they took the rank and file um, retirement funds of their regular employees and they paid their bills with it and they paid their officers with it and then they bankrupted the company and shut it down so you had employees that had worked there for a decade or two decades and thought they had this retirement and all of a sudden didn't 
and it was kind of the Enron of the 60s, so to speak. And it took Congress a couple of years to get their act together and figure out and have a, a bill that everyone could agree on. But ERISA came about in 1974, and it protects that, so that will not happen again. So when you think about, well, does ERISA apply to my plan or not, that's the kind of policy concerns that the Department of Labor has. So in an, in an individual retirement account, an IRA that we were talking about before, where you take somebody's payroll out and you put it into an IRA that their name is on, that they own, that the employer does not have their hands in, RISA doesn't really care about that because the employer cannot take the money in an IRA and go pay their light bill with it or go pay their... Mercedes lease with or anything like that. I mean, that money belongs to that person because it's in that person's name and they actually report that on their taxes. But when we get into 401k plans and some of these other plans we're talking about, ERISA does care about that because the money is actually held under the employer's name on behalf of the employee. And so you can see why the Department of Labor starts to care about that at that point. Um, and then obviously the Internal Revenue Code cares about all of this because all of it is um, a tax savings for people. Um, and if you're a for-profit in an entity, it's a tax write-off. Okay, so there are ongoing obligations for retirement plans. Um, if you're subject to ERISA, you have to do an annual filing on what's called a Form 5500. It's an IRS filing. It's an informational filing. There's no tax that has to be paid for it. Um, but even though it's an IRS filing, you file it with the Department of Labor. And that's a whole nother talk that we can, <laughs> if you're ever interested in the history of that. But the Department of Labor takes over um, that responsibility, even though it's an IRS filing, much like the, uh, a 990 or something like that. But it's for retirement plans. Um, retirement plans also have to um, have non-discrimination testing. And what that is, is um, when ERISA came about in the 70s and as it's morphed through the decades, they want to make sure that an ERISA plan does not benefit only highly compensated people. They want to make sure it applies to everyone on a, it doesn't have to be exactly equal basis. There's a range, but when you fall outside that range, um, there's extra contributions and extra things you have to do. The reason it's important, even for small entities, is that if you decide to offer one of these plans that is subject to ERISA, you have to test it every year. And what that means is you either have to hire somebody within your organization that understands this, which is usually rare, even for big companies, or you have to hire an outside vendor to do all of this testing for you to make sure that it's not discriminatory. And when I say it's not discriminatory, I don't mean, oh, we're giving men more than women. That's not the kind of discrimination I'm talking about. I'm talking about compensation discrimination. And the Internal Revenue Code in ERISA says that anyone that makes over a set amount of money each year, this year it's $120,000, is considered highly compensated. And we don't want to deplete a, um, our retirement plans only for the benefit of those highly compensated people. And so that's when that's what we mean when we say non-discrimination testing. We want to make sure the person making $20,000 a year benefits from the plan at a substantially similar level. And I don't mean dollar amount, I mean percentage-wise based on their compensation. But benefits from the plans similarly to someone who makes $150,000. Now, um, with these, these types of retirement plans, this is, these are some ERISA rules here um, and some IRS rules. Um, that because the rules are more complicated, the mistakes are more likely. And there's always a way to correct the mistakes. Um, and there are programs in place. The good thing about this is, is if you have an error because you didn't test or you didn't file or something like that, you're not the first person to do that. And the government entities know that. And they have some amazing programs for you to come and 
say I'm sorry and plead your case and pay very, very minimal fines and sometimes no fines um, for mistakes if it's done pro if, if it's corrected properly. If you don't correct it properly, there are huge fines and, and huge liability for these things. Um, the, the Internal Revenue Code has rules and they say that um, they have some non-discrimination rules. They have the maximum contribution limits that an employee can put in, like in 2019. For most plans, an employee can only put in $19,000 of their salary in it. There's some limits on um, how long you can have vesting and things like that. So the rules um, get more complicated as um, as you get, as you have a more sophisticated plan. One thing um, about ERISA, though, um, church plans are exempt from ERISA. When you're exempt from ERISA, it means you don't have to do that informational filing on the Form 5500. There's some disclosures to participants that you don't have to do. Um, and and they're, they, it's actually a very good thing to be exempt from ERISA. So church plans are exempt from ERISA. The problem is ERISA doesn't really define what a church plan is. And the definition of what a church plan is and what an entity that considers themselves to be a church who's sponsoring a retirement plan, what their obligations are, has gone up to the Supreme Court. Um, and, um, and, and it's been heavily litigated. What does it mean to be a church plan so that I don't have to do and, and jump through all these hurdles and I don't have to follow all these extra rules? Um, the definition is still kind of up in the air, <laughs> but we're getting closer and closer um, to um, to some black and white rules, um, but but basically what the case, the most recent case that went up to the Supreme Court, I think it was two years ago, it may have been three years ago now, um, was a hospital that was sponsored, it was affiliated with a church, but it was a huge hospital. And the hospital was saying, hey, we're, we're a church plan, we don't have to do all these extra rules. Um, even though they didn't really, I mean, they were affiliated with the church and their history started out of a church, um, but they weren't really a mission church organization now. They were a tax-exempt entity, but they didn't really, um, they weren't really controlled by the church. They, they There wasn't a lot of um, privity or um, association with the church except the name and maybe from a historical um, position. And so because of that, some hospitals um, have realized, hey, we're probably not church plans after all, and we need to do all these extra things. And kind of a fallout from that as well has been schools. A lot of time churches have private schools. Um, the cat, you know, a lot of Catholic schools and, and other type of Christian um, and church schools, and they may have retirement plans and have thought that they have fallen under this church plan exemption and not done all these extra things that non-church plans have to do and um, they probably need to start doing those unless the church actually controls the school um, then they're probably not a church organization for a retirement plan purpose they, they're still a tax-exempt nonprofit but they're not a kind of subset of that for, for it to be considered a church plan, um, especially if, if the school has a separate board of directors that's independent from the church. Um, it's kind of a dead giveaway that, that you're not a church plan anymore. So um, this has kind of been a huge shift in the past few years from the way some retirement plans have been, been operated. So if, if you are affiliated with a church and you have a retirement plan you, and you haven't looked to see what you're doing or if you're claiming this exemption, and you may have claimed this exemption for 20 years and you don't even know that you're claiming anymore because it's just the way we've always done it, but you probably need to look at this now um, either with an attorney or with your vendor or, or somebody that, that knows some, um, some of these rules. Anyway, wanted to say church plans are exempt from ERISA, meaning they don't have to do a lot of this extra thing, extra things, um, but 
depending on how your organization set up, even though you may be St. Mary's Catholic School, you may not be considered a church school for our purposes. Um, the next thing is government plans are exempt from ERISA as well. And the tax code puts government and tax exempt plans in kind of the same bucket a lot of the times. Um, and so government plans would be like a county of, um, you know, count, Fulton County, um, County employees may have a separate retirement plan, and they may have a very, they fall under the similar rules from um, as a tax exempt entity, but they have kind of a pass on some of these more complicated things. Okay, so we've kind of gone through that. Let's, get, let's dig into a 401k plan. That's a very common term. People kind of understand what a 401k plan is. Is a 401k plan can be offered by a nonprofit. It also can be offered um, by a for profit. And most companies that offer a retirement plan, especially for profits, have a 401k plan. This is the most common type of retirement plan it is. Um, 401k plans are subject to ERISA, unless it's a church plan, as we said before. Governments um, are not eligible to have a 401k plan but tax-exempt entities may. Under a 401k plan, employees can contribute up to $19,000 for 2019. If you're age 50 and over, you can contribute an extra $6,000. Um, so if you're 50 and over, you can contribute up to $25,000 of your salary. Um, Employers may, but do not have to, contribute to the 401k. The 401k plan can just be an entity um, for an employee to contribute. Um, if employers do contribute, they um, cannot contribute more than $56,000 this year, and that includes whatever the employee contributed as well. So the total contributions going into the plan for the year cannot be more than 56000 You can see how if an employee contributes less, the employer could contribute more. Um, so sometimes people don't think that's quite fair, but that's just the way the rules are. Um, you can also contribute um, Roth contributions, which means they're taxed now and the earnings um, are not taxed later, or after-tax contributions, which means they're taxed now later the earnings are taxed but what you put in never is um, so 401k plans are fairly flexible to set up a 401k plan you actually have to have a written plan document well where do you you get that well whoever's helping you set up the 401k plan will help you with the document most financial entities have like a form 401k plan and you kind of check the boxes almost like a multiple choice test is really what it looks like um, and they will help you do that you don't have to hire somebody um, to go in and set you up a plan document the plan documents are usually fifteen hundred dollars or twenty five hundred dollars or maybe even free depending on what bank or what entity you're going with, but the plan document shouldn't cost you tens of thousands of dollars, even though it is a very complicated legal document. Um, the employer must also have to have a separate bank account as a trust to hold all the money, and they have to appoint a trustee, and the money actually has to go into the trust. <laughs> and when if an employee decides to um, withhold or, or contribute or defer a portion of their salary to a 401k retirement plan, the employer has to put the money into the trust and the trustee then oversees um, the money at that point. Now the employee in a 401k plan has an individual account and they can invest through a number of options that the plan is set up, usually mutual funds, and the employee can direct the investments, but as far as the money actually being in somebody's hands, it's in the trustee's hands until the employee retires. Um, the employer must have a record keeping system and um, this is important just to maintain the plan but it's also important for auditing purposes. Like I said, a 401k plan is subject to ERISA unless you're a church plan. Um, and so the Department of Labor can come and audit you as well as the IRS. So you want to have a very good record keeping system that's organized um, and you need to keep it for, for many years. Um, 
the employer must also provide information to employees about when they're eligible to start and what the plan is about and when you can get your money out and what investment options you can invest in. You can't just start a 401k plan and not tell them things. Um, and the disclosures are part of the Internal Revenue Code as well as ERISA. Now, an ERISA plan has to file that annual form 5500, that's that informational return, unless you're a church plan and you're exempt. So you can see that, especially to help set up the plan document, to have a trustee, you can have an individual trustee or you can put the bank as the trustee, um, the record keeping system and filing these forms, you're probably going to have to pay a vendor or someone to, to do these things for you. So there's some cost associated with this. Um, the 401k plan is good for small employers where cash flow is an issue because there's a lot of flexibility in contributions and plan designs. Um, and you can say that um, only this group of employees are eligible for a 401k plan and this group is not, such as part-time employees, not eligible for a 401k plan. A lot of times that's very attractive to, to an entity to exclude some employees. If you start in excluding groups of employees, you have to make sure it's not discriminatory that because that's part of the 401k plan and you have to make sure that your plan generally benefits at least 70% of your employee population that's not highly compensated. Um, so if you're excluded, if you're an entity and you have, let's say for example, 10 bus drivers and two office staffs and you exclude all of your bus drivers from your 401k plan um, as a group, your plan is not going to pass this testing because you're not covering 70% of your employees if you've excluded 10 out of 12 people. So, um, so you have to well, you can exclude people, you still have to cover at least 70% of your population that's not highly compensated. Remember, that's that $120,000, $125,000 mark. Um, so um, there are ways, so the, the, this non-discrimination testing has to be done every year. You're probably going to have to pay somebody to do it. Um, the financial institutions and people who hold your mutual funds and give you options for investment typically do this or one of their um, administrators they're associated with will do the testing for you. They have computer programs for it so it shouldn't cost you tens of thousands of dollars it should, I mean, but, uh, but it is going to cost a couple of thousand dollars a year to, to have the testing. You do need to keep records of the testing to show that you've passed all these things. Um, there are certain types of plans that you can put in place um, so that you don't have to do some testing. You're still going to have to do some others. But as an alternative to non-discrimination testing, you can adopt what's called a safe harbor plan. And in a safe harbor plan, the employer has to contribute money to the plan each year. Remember when we talked about a few slides ago in a 401k plan, the employer does not have to contribute to a 401k plan. But if you don't contribute to the 401k plan, you do have to do testing. And if you fail the testing, you have to give money back to people or give more money to the plan or, you know, do fix the numbers so that you pass. Um, so instead of doing the testing, you can set up a plan where you put money in. And it has to be at certain levels to be exempt from the testing. And one is, is if you make a non-elective contribution of 3%. Non-elective means you put 3% of people's compensation into the plan regardless of whether they contribute or not. Regardless of what they've elected, you have to do that. The other one is you can do a matching. And the matching, you can always be more generous than this, but kind of the, the minimum requirement is you have to do a 100% match up to 3% of their comp compensation and then 50% match of the next 2% of their compensation for total. If they put 5% of their compensation in, then you've matched 4%. And that's the minimum. You can always do more than that. 
If you do these, again, you're not required to, but if you do these and you do some other notices and things like that, then you don't have to do all of this complicated testing that is required. Um, we have a question. Sure. Um, how are do these percentages apply to part-time seasonal employees? Do you do the same analysis or is that a whole other topic. So, um, so testing is a, is, a, is a lot of regulations and a, and a lot of code. Some, depending on, um, the, usually if they work more than a thousand hours a year, then they have to be included in the testing. So there's not a yes, you always include them or no, you always exclude them kind of answer. It's we need more information about what your seasonal employees do. A thousand hours a year is, um, well, 2,080 hours a year is 40 hours a week. So a thousand hours a year is about a 20 hour a week employee um, or someone working full time for half the year. So if they're working full time for half the year or work more than 20 hours a week, they're probably going to have to be included in your testing, and I say probably in all caps, <laughs> because there's there's some more minefields and some other things to, um, to meander around, but that's kind of a back of the envelope kind of um, guess. Um, so, so interns typically just work for like a semester or just during the summer, and so they typically don't hit that thousand hours, so typically you, you can exclude interns. Um, also, in a 401k plan, you don't have to have people eligible until they're age 21. So if your interns are younger than that, you can exclude them automatically, even if they work more hours than that. Um, your seasonal employees, again, you need more information um, depending on how much they're working and, and how, how long and if they're hitting that 1,000 hour, hour mark. But that, um, so there's... That's not a black and white rule, but that's kind of a, a rule of thumb. Is that it? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the important thing about the 401k plan is you actually have to put the money into the trust account. And you actually have deadlines for putting the money in the trust account. And if you don't put the money in the trust account, then um, within the deadline, then the employer has to pay for lost earnings as well as anything else that the person could have lost for the day or two days that, that you missed. There's actually a DOL calculator to calculate the lost earnings depending on what day it is and what the interest rate is at that time. And the DOL is a stickler about this. I have argued with them over pennies that needed to go in because someone was a day late and someone could have earned three cents. And they they will fight for that three cent for that employee. Or that employee. So um, this is a very serious thing. You actually have to move the money to the to the trust. If you're listening to this, you're like, oh yeah, we're going to move the money to the trust. Like, who doesn't do that? Well, when somebody goes, gets married, and they're in charge of moving the money to the trust, and they're gone for two weeks, a week to get married and a week for their honeymoon, and nobody else knows how to move the money to the trust. So if there's only one person that's doing this, you need to have a backup because we see that all the time or somebody's out on maternity leave and they didn't realize this is part of their job <laughs> that they did or someone left kind of abruptly and didn't leave did instructions for the next person coming into place so because people are in charge of moving money to the trust there are errors because people are not in the office every day and um, for one reason or another, a kid is sick, somebody's married, somebody's having a baby. So, I mean, there's, you can see where all these excuses pop up. And it's not that an employer has any bad intention to hold on to that money, but it just happens. Or maybe they changed payroll systems and they couldn't get the payroll to talk to the bank like it did. Um, and, and maybe for the first payroll cycle, it's all messed up or, or um, something like that. So there are strict timelines for plans less than 100 participants has to be within seven days <coughs> following the payroll date that it was withheld from their salary. But it really should be as soon as, as, soon as you can. There are some other deadlines for larger employees. <coughs> so that's a 401k plan. It's the most common type of plan that people are used to hearing about. 
that that um, companies offer, mainly because for-profit companies offer them. The next type of plan we're going to talk about is the 403B plan. So all of these plans are named after the tax code section that governs them, if you haven't noticed. Like a 401k plan, the rules that govern that are in internal, internal revenue code section 401k. <laughs> so the 403B plan is in internal revenue code section 403B. So a 403B plan is, um, is an interesting plan and it has an interesting history, but they are only allowed to be offered by tax-exempt organizations and um, some government entities like public schools. Um, so a 403B plan, um, a for-profit employer can offer this. And so because of that, they're not as well known. Um, now, if you have, I know like the retirement system of Georgia has a 403B plan. So like a lot of times people at hospitals have a 403B plan, schools have 403B plans. So those type of people are familiar with these types of plans, but they're still not as prevalent as a 401K. But if you're a tax exempt entity, you get a choice if you want to offer this plan or a 401K plan. And it's not that one is better than the other, they're just different. So we're going to talk about some of the differences. Um, a 403B plan is not considered to be a qualified retirement plan. Well, you probably don't care so much about that as an employer, but um, as uh, someone practicing in this area, it means that um, you don't have as many uh, um, things you can rely on from the Internal Revenue Service that, that says your plan is okay. Um, and so um, in a 401k environment, there's lots of plan languages, there's lots of plan documents and things like that that the IRS has said, if you use this plan document, you're absolutely fine. And if we audit you, we're not going to dig into that because we've already kind of pre-approved this. A 403B environment's a little different just because they're not as prevalent. The IRS doesn't have as many documents that they've pre-approved. Doesn't mean that your document's wrong. It just means you may have to jump through a few more hurdles in an audit or if someone questions you about it. Um, it's just, and it's just because there's not as many of these out there. Employees in the past could only make contributions to annuities. Now that changed about, I don't know, 20 years ago or something like that. And now employees can make contributions to mutual funds as well. But you may hear these called tax deferred annuities as well. Um, because historically that was the only thing that could be invested in this. So only certain type of employers can adopt a 403B plan, and basically they're tax-exempt entities and some other public school systems and things like that. Now, one of the main differences between the 403B and a 401K plan is this non-discrimination rule. So 403B plans don't have to do all of this non-discrimination testing that a 401K plan has. They have a universal availability requirement as well. In a 401k plan, we can exclude people from participating in the 401k plan. People with red badges, people who drive trucks, you know, whatever. As long as we um, don't discriminate based on age, race, nationality, um, and it passes the other test that the IRS puts in place. In a 403b plan, you have to have everyone participate in the plan. Um, the only people you can exclude are listed here, and only part-time workers working fewer than 20 hours a week can be excluded. So that means if you're a school and you offer this, your bus driver who works more than 20 hours a week has to be in this plan. Your janitor who's part-time who um, has to be in this plan if they're working more than 20 hours a week. You cannot exclude a lot of people. You can exclude student employees, which usually means interns, um, but that's really about it. Um, unless they're not a U.S. citizen, <laughs> they're in the 403B plan. So you don't have as much flexibility in who you can offer this to, but then you don't have as much administration in testing it as well. So if you're going to offer your 401K plan to everyone into any way, um, a 403B plan may be 
just a good or better choice for you because you don't have as many testing and administration that you have to jump through in a 403B plan. Just a thought. If you're trying to exclude a group of employees, you can never use a 403B plan. Another way you can never use a 403B plan is if it's so, like I said, only a tax-exempt entity can offer it. Well, if you're a tax-exempt entity and then you have a for-profit subsidiary, a restaurant or, I don't know, um, like hospitals have like the dialysis centers tend to be for profit or, or something like that, that, then those people can't be in your 403B plan. And so you're going to have to have a 401K plan for them because it's a for profit entity, right? So if you're going to have to have a for profit, I mean a 401K plan for your subsidiary that's a for profit, you might as well just have a 401K plan for every your nonprofit and just have one plan otherwise you're going to have to have two different plans that you've got to keep up with and the rules are different not that that's bad but that's kind of more work for you um, so there's things to think about like that if you have a for-profit subsidiary the nonprofit parent can have a 403b plan but it may not be your best choice if you're trying to to be uniform and things like that but you do see a lot of errors and I've seen it a lot in my career where the nonprofit entity has a 403b plan has had it for decades they start a for-profit subsidiary they put all those people in the retirement plan you can't do that and if you have done that there's ways to fix it if you don't fix it you're gonna have huge penalties eventually because someone will figure that out eventually um, but there's ways to fix it at minimal cost. Okay, non-discrimination testing is the next slide and I've kind of already gone over that. Um, you're subject to some non-discrimination testing but basically like the non-discrimination testing is very minimal for a 403B plan. Okay, 43B plans can be exempt from ERISA. So what does that mean again? That means we don't have to file the form 5500 with all the informational stuff that you probably have to hire somebody to fill out because it's pretty long and complicated. Um, you don't have to do a lot of disclosures. You don't have to have a separate trust account, things like that. Um, so a 403B plan are not subject to ERISA if employee contributions are the only thing going in there and there's not employer contributions. So again, if you're a nonprofit entity and you're not going to put as the employer money into your retirement plan, start a 403B plan, not a 401K plan, because you can do a 403B plan, not subject to ERISA, not have to do non-discrimination requirements, not have to do all this extra ERISA stuff, and it'll really help your administration. Um, now, if you want to do employer contributions, you can still have a 403B plan. It's just subject to ERISA, which just means you have to do some filings and some extra things. So it's not like you're completely out of the water. You can still have a 403B plan benefit from some of this lesser non-discrimination requirements and um, do the ERISA things as well. Um, but 403B plans generally not subject to ERISA if um, the employer is not involved, which means they don't give contributions. It also means there's no loans available from the retirement account um, and um, no hardship withdrawals. If you want to offer those things, again, you can be in a RISA 403B plan. That's fine. Now, in the past, <clears throat> kind of historically, um, Tax-exempt entities would sometimes offer two 403B plans, one that wasn't subject to ERISA that only had employee contributions in it, and then one that only had employer contributions in it, um, maybe some employee contributions, but you can see why they would segregate them because one would be subject to ERISA and the other wouldn't. Um, I always think that's more complicated than it's worth because if you're subject to ERISA for one, why not just treat everybody the same because then you're going to have to always remember, okay, is this the plan subject to ERISA or is this not because our rules are <laughs> different. You might as well, if you're subject to it for one, you might as well just combine the plans and have one plan instead of two. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. You certainly can have two, four, three B plans. 
um, and you'll see that quite often. Um, so anyway, 4-3-B plans sponsored by, um, okay, let me back up. Remember, government entities cannot have a 401k plan unless it was grandfathered from the 80s or something like that that you rarely see. But government entities can have a 403B plan, um, and they're exempt from ERISA. Remember, church plans are exempt from ERISA as well. So you could be a 403B church plan and be exempt. Okay. Um, there's some special things for 403B plans that you can offer. One is that um, extra catch-up contribution for people over age 50. It's $6,000. Um, but in a 403B plan only, not available in a 401K plan, there's also a catch-up contribution for people who've worked 15 years or more with that entity. They can contribute more money regardless of their age. So if they started at age 20, they're now 35, they can contribute more um, money to the 403B plan, not available in a 401K plan. Um, employers can also continue to make employer, I didn't finish my sentence there, but um, employers can also continue to make contributions to people who have terminated up to five years after they left the entity, after they've separated from service, the employer can continue to make, doesn't have to, it's optional, <laughs> but they can. Why would you want to do that? Well, you can't do that in a 401k plan, and you're probably scratching your head going, I've never heard of this, and we're usually used to the 401k plan environment. But some tax-exempt entities find this very appealing when they have a director or an officer who worked for them through all the bad times for 10 years, they brought this entity up, they're retiring, and they're retiring with less than they would have had if they had worked somewhere else. And so they'll say, hey, we'll continue to contribute to you after you retire for another five years. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a perk and it's a way to reward some of your, your long service and loyal employees who have since retired. Okay, those are four 3B plans. They're, they're a lot of fun. You can see how um, you can be an entity and you can do a 401k plan, but maybe a 403B plan will be cheaper, um, administratively less hassle, and um, be a better choice for you. Um, a question. Mm -hmm. What should an organization consider if they're choosing between a 403B plan versus just the payroll deduction IR. So a 403B plan is going to have more administration and more record keeping. If you as the employer are not putting any money in, then maybe the payroll deduction would be best. Now remember the payroll deduction IRA, you can only allow someone to contribute $6,000. In the 403B, they can contribute $19,000 if they're over age 50, another six, and if they've done 15 years of service, there's, no, there's more they can contribute as well. So if the employee wants to contribute more than $6,000, maybe a 403B plan is, is the way to go. Um, so it's not like one's better. I mean, with that extra perk, there's some more things you have to do. But if it's just employee contributions and you're not doing employer contributions, it wouldn't be subject to ERISA. You wouldn't have to, to do any of the other things. But um, as far as non-discrimination testing and things like that, but remember, in a 403B plan, um, everybody has to be eligible. Basically, Part-time employees that work over 20 hours a week have to be eligible. So your janitors, your you know your part-time people that you normally don't think they should have a retirement plan, um, because that's kind of the 401k mentality. Because we tend to exclude that group in a 401k plan, you can't do that in a 403b plan. So you just kind of need to look at your population. If you're not putting the money in. Offer it to the janitor. If they don't want to contribute to it, who cares? We don't. We don't have to make them. Um, so it just kind of depends on your population and kind of what you want to offer. Um, the four three B plans are offered at many financial institutions, but not as many as a 401k plan because they're just not as prevalent. So if the person is wanting to contribute in a certain mutual fund or something like that, it may be harder to find an entity to do that in the 403b environment, um, whereas an IRA, 
you know, they can, you're kind of out of it. They just do what they want. But in a 403B plan, you have to pick the entity that offers the investment alternative. So there may be a little more um, digging to, to find a financial institution that offers investment platforms that you want to offer. Anyway, a 457 plan. A 457 plan is in the Internal Revenue Code 457. And they've, even though it's in the same code, it's really two different plans if a government sponsors it versus if a tax exempt entity it sponsors it. So in this section, I have put in what the government requirements are just so you don't Google 457 plans and come up with rules and go, hey, that's not what she said, um, because there's very different rules for government and tax exempt entities. But one of the um, things about a 457 plan is under the code, it cannot be offered to everyone. It can only be offered to a select group of management or highly compensated employees. So if you're trying to reward your, now that's not true for government, so if you Google 457 plan, you may have the government description come up where it's offered to everyone. But a 457B plan, NF plan, um, is very attractive to an organization that doesn't want to cover everyone. And if they exclude a bunch of people, they're not going to pass testing in the 401k because they're not going to offer it to 70% of their employees. A 457B plan is very good if you want to offer it to your one officer or your two or three management people and you don't want to offer it to everyone else. This is um, very attractive. The limits are $19,000. The taxation is a little different. The taxation amount is taxed when it's paid or made available. And that's a little tricky thing to jump around because that's not necessarily when they retire. They may be able to get the money after they've worked 10 years um, of service or however the plan is designed. So when a 457B plan is going to be a little bit more complicated to structure, you're going to have to pay maybe even an attorney to help you draft it because you want to make sure the person isn't taxed before they actually hold on to the money. And so there's, there's a little bit more um, kind of legal loopholes you have to jump around with this, but it's worth it if you only want to offer it to a select group of kind of your high management people. Um, so the key differences between a 401k plan and a 403b plan from a 457 plan um, is that um, you can't, um, there's no distribution on death and disability, which there is distribution on death and disability in the 401k plan. The um, employee's election to contribute has to be made before the first day of the month in which compensation is paid, which is usually before they start employment in that election, unless the employee's election to defer like 10% of their um, salary sticks with them their whole career, usually absent some extenuating circumstances. Where we're used to a 401k environment where you can change it, maybe you can change it annually, you can change it whenever you want to, 403b plans are like that, you can change it annually, every day, every quarter, however it's set up. A 457b plan, you cannot go and change it like that. Um, so you can see how there's a little bit more restrictions from the tax standpoint um, that, that allow you to only offer it to this tiny group of, of employees. So with more restrictions come a little bit more um, administration. There's no non-discrimination testing. Um, you don't have to have employee contributions, which is where they have to elect and it stays in place their whole um, career, but you can if you want. But employer contributions, you can put money into that. So if you're trying to sock away money for um, for a, an officer or something, this might, just one officer, this would probably be a good way to go. Um, you can see catch-up contributions aren't allowed, loan not allowed, you're not allowed to have a trust for this. This money sits in the general assets um, in a separate column, but in the general assets of the entity, and you don't have to have a trustee. And you can kind of see in this chart some of um, some of the things. Now, this chart has the differences between the governmental 
457B plan and the tax exempt 457B plan just because I didn't want you to Google something and go, hey, wait, that's not what she said because a lot of times Google doesn't dif differentiate between the two <laughs> unless you have a very deep article. Okay. That's really the end of this presentation. The rest of these slides, I've made a chart that kind of goes through a comparison of the 401k plan, a 403b plan, and a 457b plan for a tax-exempt entity that's not a government plan. And it kind of goes through by topics like who's eligible as an employee, what investments can you do, what are the employee contribution limits. I'm not going to read out that table to you. You can look at it if you want. Um, but you can see how there's not really a better plan. If you're just trying to figure out what you're trying to do and the amount of administration you have kind of ongoing. And if you can kind of balance a way to have retirement for employees and lesser, I mean, as minimal amount of administration for you as you can um, so that it doesn't cost as much, it's not as stressful, and really it reduces the amount of mistakes, um, you can see how you have quite a few options to, to choose from. Um, we have uh, one question. Sure. Um, could you, going back a little further to the beginning, could you just initial, just briefly talk about what are the first steps in setting up uh, payroll deduction IRA? Okay, yeah. So the first step is you should um, go and find a bank that you can put your payroll deductions in. So um, the, the employee will have to set up their own IRA and then they'll give you an account number and then your payroll or even you write a manual check. You just put it into the IRA it, and it can be as manual or as automated as your payroll system and the bank will allow. And um, sometimes this means writing out a manual check, <laughs> sticking it in the mail and mailing it to um, the, the person's IRA. Um, account, but it could be more automated than that. And I mean, it just it, it varies depending on the bank, your payroll provider, and um, and and things like that. But I think the first step is to talk to the employee about where his IRA is and see if, how you can put money into it. Okay. Great. Um, well, that's all the questions we yeah. have. Thank you. Leah. Thank you.